Welcome back to our, our Tuesday morning Bible class. We're in Acts chapter 20 and uh, pray that you are preparing to have a wonderful Thanksgiving celebration with family or friends or even, even if you're, if you're home alone, that it be a blessed time to remember God's good gifts. Um, in our prayers, excuse me, go out to, today to Mark and Lori and and to Mark's mom, as his his father passed away yesterday, so we'll remember we'll remember Mark and Lori and and Mark's mom and all their family in in our prayers this day and and uh, throughout this season. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for our time together to be in your Word. We thank you for all the blessings that we enjoy as citizens of the United States as as especially citizens of your holy church and heirs of your eternal life. We pray that you would remind us always of, of our duty of thanksgiving for the many blessings that you've poured out into our lives. We pray that you would be a comfort and a strength for Mark's mom and, and for Mark and Lori and Aaron and, and all their dear ones, that you give them comfort and peace in, in each day ahead that they take comfort in the faith of, of Mark's father and, and the glorious hope that, that we all have through Christ in his resurrection. Guide us now as we study your word together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, back in, in, Mar in Acts chapter 20, excuse me, I'm going to, it's this, this, well, I guess it's, to me, it feels like it's been quick changing. Everything's going along, and then it's cold. Now my nose is going to be running on me. So, so I got a cough drop in my pocket if you need it. Oh, okay. I got some in my purse. Should should be good there. So, um, you know, in if you noticed in Acts chapter nineteen, Paul is is again he's Acts chapter nineteen. The end of it is this crazy riot there in Ephesus. Where they're all standing around in the in the Ephesian Colosseum, which they were all kind of made like that, but this is more like an amphitheater in the side of a hill, still there, um, and and for two hours they're shouting, "Great is Artemis of the Ephesians," and and upset because Paul represents a threat to their the commercial enterprise of selling their false god. Uh, but it's something that I didn't pick up on and wanted to just note last time in verse 21 is that in chapter 19 is after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and to go to Jerusalem, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. And it is... Rome, obviously, is the capital of the empire. It's the most influential place. It's where Paul Paul wants to be in the action. It's where Paul wants to be able to go and proclaim the gospel. If you read the book of Romans, you'll notice that, that he wants to go to Rome to, to preach the gospel in Rome, and he wants to do it with the expressed intent of using that as his mission base to take the gospel to Spain. So Paul is... You know, whenever we're thinking about what we're going to eat for breakfast the next morning or making it through the next day, Paul's got this expansive, incredible worldwide view of what what the mission should be. And he's going to take this. So he wants to go to Rome. But even as he says he wants to go to Rome, his his farther goal is to take it all the way, really to take it all the way to the Atlantic Ocean and to take it over to the, the coast of Spain and and to preach the gospel there. So <clears throat> anyway, back in chapter 20. After the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, he said farewell and departed for Macedonia. It doesn't give us any, any real uh, indication of the time that went away there, but just when the hubbub finally died down and, and maybe the, the danger died down a little bit, he met together and encouraged them, then departed for Macedonia. If you think Macedonia, you're thinking like Thessalonica. Mm -hmm. The yellow one. <coughs> I guess there's more than one yellow one. Yeah, there is more. Oh, 
Yeah. Mm, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so, so he d- departed for Me- Macedonia. When he had gone through those regions and had given them much encouragement, he came to Greece. Therefore, he spent there, excuse me, he spent three months. And when a plot was made against him by the Jews, as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return through through Macedonia. So again, he's he's there for three months in Greece, pre- preaching the gospel in Athens, and there you have the uh, once again the the Jewish hostility to the gospel, and, and it's almost like these people are following Paul around wherever he goes, and they probably are. They probably actually are following Paul from place to place to place. So if you think Greece there, we've got Athens. So Did you want me to read that? <clears throat> no, I'm sorry. Right over there. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> actually, I have other ones. Is there anybody else? Thank you. Oh. Okay. <laughs> That's all right. Sopater, the Berean. Um, so we're going to get to meet some of the traveling companions or partners in ministry with Paul. The Bereans, you remember we met the Bereans in Acts 17, and they were the ones that Paul said were of more noble character. Because when the Bereans heard God's word, that they went home to check every day to see if what Paul said was true. So Sopater, is, he's of that group. From Berea. Sopater the Berean, the son of Pyrrhus, presumably, now these mean, names mean very little to us, but presumably they were men of some, some renown, that there was a reason that he would name them this way. Mm-hmm. Sopater, son of Pyrrhus. Well, that, that would help me zero. It doesn't clear it up for me at all. But probably, you know, whenever you... Sometimes whenever you see Paul name extra people like that, it would have meant something to those people. A company, Sopater accompanied him. And of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus and Gaius of Derby, uh, the Thessalonians in Acts 17 also, he, was, he went to Thessalonia. Derby, um, remember after... In chapter 14, he was stoned and left for dead. Mm-hmm. And they then he then all the dis- other brothers in Christ got up, put their arms around Paul. They prayed with him and, and, uh, and brought him back into the city. Then the next day he went on to, to Derby. That's where, where that is. So what got uh, 14. Okay. So that was Gaius of Derby. And then Timothy, of course, we met in chapter 16. And the Asians, Tychicus and Trophimus. So the Asians, Tychicus and Trophimus are, um, um, you know, presumably they're Ephesians. Um, but I'm not smart enough to remember that off the top of my head. So <laughs> I'll, we'll leave that. These went on ahead and were waiting for us. If you notice a little, a little shift here that to this point, He has been narrating Paul's travels and, you know, Paul was about to set sail. He decided to return. Now it's back to the us talk because now Luke is on board again. Well, almost literally on board, but he's Luke is along with them now. They were waiting for us at Troas, but we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread. And in five days, we came to them at Troas where we stayed for seven days. Uh, unleavened bread, the days of unleavened bread, are, are that's the Passover. It'd be like middle of Nissan 15, 16, that ballpark. The days of unleavened bread would have been the week surrounding that, or it would have been an eight-day observance, seven, eight-day observance. Uh, maybe it's just the seven days after <clears throat> the Passover but that would have all been described as un, the unleavened bread. That was a feast that every Jewish male was supposed to be in Jerusalem. Of course, Paul clearly is not in Jerusalem. So um, 
what are we to make of that? Well, I think there would be a lot of times where Jews that were dispersed in different places would have a hard time making it back to Jerusalem. So not necessarily anything, but maybe it, it is indicative of a new um, freedom that Paul was felt with respect to the laws of the Old Testament with the ceremonial law of the Old Testament, knowing that Christ had fulfilled it, that his more important work than being back to celebrate the, the days of unleavened bread was mm -hmm. his more important work was to be preaching Jesus. So that is, that's a little bit of conjecture, but I'm, I'm trying to figure out the, what the import of, of that, if, Luke's indication there, we sailed from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, why he wasn't, didn't feel any need to be there. So, um, so I am reading something into it. Just um, you take that for what it's worth. Where we stayed there for se seven days. On the first day of the week, when we, of course, Sunday, very early, we notice in the in the book of Acts, and we notice, actually you notice this in the Gospels too, all of the resurrection accounts, and also in the book of Acts, and then in the epistles, how early on it seems like that Sunday eclipsed Saturday as the day of worship, as, as the day that they gathered together. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread. Again, Luke's with them. <clears throat> what are they doing when they break bread? Um, it is, it's virtually certain that they were receiving the Lord's Supper together as, as a family in Christ, as a church family. But I think that it's, it's possible... It, at least that in, in some of the places here in the book of Acts, when he talks about breaking bread, he means eating. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's hard to be definitive with that. I, I think of Acts chapter 2, for instance. If you, if you remember back to Acts chapter 2, and the reason this is, a, is of interest, at least to me anyway, is is what would the question's pretty important one historically what would be what characterized the apostolic church because if it was the apostolic church then ours ought to look something like it you know if our church doesn't then what we do has nothing to do with what they did then we've probably got a problem because because they were you know Paul spoke to the Lord himself whenever whenever uh, Jesus appeared to him. So, um, so that's the reason I'm kind of investigating just this question of, of the breaking of bread. And, and I, I'm not saying that we can give a definitive answer here, but in Acts chapter 2, at verse 42, it has this characterization of the early worship life of the church. They devote, and this is the, the immediate post-Pentecost life of the church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, okay. so sermons, right? The apostles' teaching, presumably it was textual, or presumably it was on Scripture. So, you know, that, wouldn't, that would include the reading of the Old Testament word, but the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Now, you know, verse 46, a little later, it says, And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they receive their food with glad and generous hearts. So I think there's, there's, there's a case you could, could make that in some places, breaking of bread probably means more than just having a potluck dinner. Mm -hmm. But in some cases, I think it might just mean a potluck that they ate together. So, mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, I think that the, the, the fellowship, e either way, there's, there's little question in my, in my view that the koinonia or the fellowship of that they 
enjoyed together included the Lord's Supper. It included the preaching of the word. It included prayers. So does ours. That's what we do together. We receive the Lord's Supper together. That's what we do together. And you know, sometimes we literally eat together. But that's not of the necessity of what we do together. Um, the other things are, are things that God wants us to do in remembrance of him, for instance. So, you know, sometimes you would have the, the Roman Catholics at the time of the Reformation, and maybe still today, would, would point to a verse like this as, as their justification for why, why lay people were only allowed to receive one kind in the sacrament because it talks, it talks about the breaking of bread. And I think you know, the better way to receive the Lord's Supper is not to tear it apart, but Jesus says about both the bread, take and eat, and about the cup, drink of it, all of you. So that's why we don't, that's why we don't just take the body of Christ without the blood of Christ. So... They're gathered together to break bread. Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. Okay, y'all. <laughs> Can you speak that long? Can you listen that long? I think, you know... After you've ate? <laughs> I could not. That would, that would... No, I could not sp speak that long. If I could... I would have to take a nap after the first service and then come back. And <laughs> but he's, if if we imagine a meeting together in the morning and he speaks through the entire day, and and prolongs his speech until midnight, there were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered. You know, you can kind of picture it in your head. It's it's all right all day, warm day, maybe in the upper room and the heat rises and all that good stuff. And now it's candle lit and it's late, late at night. And, and everybody's eaten together. They've had fellowship together and they're getting drowsy. And a young man named Eutychus, sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead he was taken up, and that's the word necros is there for, um, it's, it's, he's taken up dead, as in, Pronounced. he's dead. Now, do you have, what do you have Different in yours? Dead. Same, okay, because mm -hmm. one of the ones I read said, oh, I don't remember how it worded it, but it almost like, well, he was close to dead or something, but it's, it <coughs> just says, he was taken up or lifted up dead after falling from the third story. Um, I can't remember how this joke goes. I've always tried to remember that. Somebody said the only cuss word in the, in the time that somebody cussed in, in the Bible and it was something like, uh, well, you'd have cussed too if you fell out the third floor window. <laughs> Eutychus, Eutychus, so Eutychus too. Anyway, he's taken up dead. Paul went down and bent over him, and taking him in his arms, said, "Do not be alarmed, for his life is in him." Um, the word there is ck, ck. Um, you, it's a part of our word for psychology, and it can mean life. It also means soul. And I think that that seems like the, the one that is, if he's dead, his life's not in him. But his, if his soul has not departed from him, that, that, is, that is, seems to me what he is saying. Don't be alarmed. His soul is in him. He's, this, there hasn't been, death is in its final expression. The awfulness of death is, is the separation of the soul from the body. Yeah, that's what a, doc, a lot of doctors will say. He's not brain dead yet. 
in being being the final thing. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, you know, for us, so <clears throat> our view of death is that these bodies are not, they're not disposable, they're not junk, they're not trash to be done away with. They are God's creation. They are the, the temple in which the Holy Spirit has chosen to dwell. And he, he kind of fumigated these temples or washed these temples, cleansing them in the waters of holy baptism to be his own. They belong to him. That's what our, our bodies are. The, the tragedy of death is that rending of, of body and soul. Now, the soul goes to be with Jesus. That's good for the soul. But it's completely, in, in, there's a sense in which it's really unnatural for us to be disembodied. God created humans to be body and soul creatures. So as, as much as, as our, when our dear ones fall asleep in Christ, or when, as, the, as Luke likes to say, or here, when our loved ones in Christ die, their souls go to be with Jesus. That's not the final. That's not the final reward or the great expectation that is so often talked about in Scripture. The Scripture's final hope and and the realization of the final hope in Scripture is when these bodies are restored and come back glorified, and they are reunited to our souls to go to be with Christ in heaven. So his soul is still in him. Whenever Jesus, whenever Jesus cried out in death from the cross, he yielded up his spirit. His soul left his body, and his body went into the, into the tomb, as all of our, our bodies are going to go into the ground. But one day, they're going to be reunited. All right, anyway, that's CK there, that... His soul is still in him, I, I, it would be how I would take verse 10. And when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a long while until daybreak, and so departed. And they took the youth away alive and were not a little comforted. Um, so you thought the sermon was long. <laughs> he kept on going. They, after, after that, they were all kind of, awakened again and got a second wind and then Paul preached until daybreak so but it says they were not a little excuse me comforted yes which means they were very comforted okay yeah mine says they were greatly comforted yeah okay it doesn't say they were <coughs> a little comforted it says they were not <coughs> a little okay I'm I also speaking. have written in here Paul miracle well, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. 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 Yep. God's uh, and you know just like all the others with the touching the handkerchiefs and all that and that kind of stuff. So the Holy Spirit is is allowing Paul to do these miracles. I'm. I totally believe God still does miracles. I think that his his miracles through the ministry of the Paul and the apostles in the early church served to establish the word. Mm -hmm. I don't know a better way to say it, to give witness to the, the truth of what God was doing through Paul. You you put your finger on, a, in verse 12, one of those little, I don't know if this is a Hebraism, because I don't know that Luke was, was Hebrew, but I don't think he was. He was, was a Gentile. But his expression that you, you notice, they were not a little comforted, is, <coughs> is an, in, it's an idiom in Greek that just means they were exceedingly comforted. Or they were really, 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 really comforted. They were, yeah, they were, <laughs> they were broken heart, hearted. And so, but what's interesting about this is this will tell you a little bit about your English Standard Version is the English Standard Version. Now, yours says great, they were greatly comforted. Now, that's how a normal person would say that. Mm -hmm. the, the English Standard Version will very often trans try to preserve 
the the language and the order instead of just seeing their job as strictly i'm going to translate this into good english they're trying to preserve the the actual order of the words are are in the text so that's why it's it's a weird way of saying it we would never say it the niv is is has a the esv has a desire to be a more literal also, very that's okay. no, those are those that's, are mm-hmm. where I'm thinking Not that literal. title is totally Not wrong. Literal. Where it says that he was raised from the dead, Paul says he's not dead. Well, now there's been many a, a times throughout oh. history where a person could be unconscious so and for so long that people have buried them, right. Why there's a bell in the casket. Right. They did back then, anyway. <laughs> well, he's, I mean, that's just picking up on verse but 9. But you know why they did that? Yeah, not in the real one. But in because the cause verse 9 just it's, says, he fell down from the third story, right, was right. taken up dead. Yeah. So but Paul doesn't say he isn't dead in so many words. He says his life is in him. Yes. So yeah. Is he talking about the soul? I yeah, think that he's talking he about the soul. He said he's alive. He's got... He said he's alive. Well, that's not what ours says. Ours, ours says, says for oh. his life is in him. Mm-hmm. It doesn't okay. say he's alive. No. But he's not it's, saying he's alive like you and I. He's saying his soul is in him. That, yeah. that word, CK, is, is that word can mean life. Mm-hmm. And it's, its first meaning is soul, life. Okay. So I'm suggesting if the guy is dead... Then what's in him still is there hasn't been this final mm-hmm. separation of mm-hmm. body and soul. Paul's saying his soul is still there; mm-hmm. <laughs> it hasn't flown the yeah, the, it hasn't left the so the roost. Yeah, but I'm still thinking, you know, he kind of knew he was still alive, even though everyone else there thought he was dead. Well, you know, he knows what he's what's going to happen. True, definitely. True. Yep. But, you know, I mean, there's been so many cases of people being in comas and, and just, you know, days or months later wake up. And the reason for the bell on the caskets was when they had unburied people to either move them or something, found claw marks on the caskets. No. That's not a pleasant picture, no. is it? But that is what they found, and therefore they had panicked and wanted bells. If they bury yeah. them, how could they hear the bell? Mm-hmm. Well, the bell would be on the oh, surface. So oh, yeah. just in the... Yeah. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. You could be ringing your hearts out, but if it's nighttime, no one Well, if it's hard me. packed, nobody... The string wouldn't move. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, First try. All right. Is there, they have engineers to figure that stuff out. All right. They're not a little comforted. Okay. So that'll just... That's just a, you'll notice that with your ESV. It's just one of those things that you will see. Their goal was to be more, uh, more literal and even to the true word order that's found in the Greek, as opposed to just straight translating it. I think it should have said something of, can you read this in the scripture that long? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it doesn't say he even went back to see the kid anymore after he just said that. But, I mean, he went no. in and he broke his bread, and, and yeah. then he leaves. Yeah. And he never even goes back to see whether he really got up or not. Well, Eutychus? Yeah. No, Wait. Paul. Oh, yeah, Paul. Well, Paul, Eutychus, Eutychus just went back up and ate with them. And mm-hmm. Well, it says Paul went back up and he broke bread and he went into verse mm-hmm. and so departed. But it doesn't say... And then it says they took the youth away alive. It doesn't say he went back and saw the kid to know that he really was oh, alive. Oh, right. Well, no. Because then yeah. the kid was with them when he came back up to the third floor. Is it important? Mm, no, no. I, I, <laughs> I would. I mean, I, I just, just imagined there. Words to not have to that he was yeah. with us. <laughs> yeah. All right. But going, verse 13. <laughs> but going ahead to the ship, we set sail from Troas. Troas, it's up here. Well, we set we, Asia, we, we set know, sail. Asos. Oh yes, yeah. we set sail well, for Asos. From, they were in Troas. So oh okay. Troas Sorry. Okay. Asos. Yes, that's where they were, intending to take Paul aboard there. So so Paul's walking at this point. 
Luke is, Luke is sailing. Intended to take Paul aboard there, for so he had arranged, intending himself to go by land. And when he met us at Asos, we took him on board and went to Mytilene. And sailing from there, we came the following day opposite Chios. The next day, we touched down at Samos. And the day after that, excuse me, we went to Miletus. For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus, so that he might not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hastening to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. So he doesn't, he's not, doesn't want to go to Ephesus because he doesn't want to take the time to be in Asia because he's in a hurry. He wants to get back uh, to Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. Pentecost would be, well, it'd be 50 days after the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So we're talking, if one, we're talking the middle of <coughs> March. For the other, we're probably talking early May. Pentecost is early May? Yes. Yep. <clears throat> Shavuot. It's uh, 6 Sivan is the, the day in the Jewish month. But So he wants to be back at, at Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. Now from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. Who are the elders? Well, in, in chapter 14, verse 23, if you remember, this isn't in Ephesus, but it, it, it answers the question well enough. But chapter 14, verse 23, it was Paul's practice whenever he preached somewhere, is Paul wants to, I mean, that's why he's always looking at Rome and Spain, and he wants to go and be on the leading edge of preaching the gospel. He doesn't want to be somewhere where he's going to be building on somebody else's foundation. Whenever he preached in a place, he would appoint elders. You look at verse 23. When they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. These were their pastors. And those words get used interchangeably here in in excuse me with respect to these Ephesians elder Ephesian elders we're going to see they get used interchangeably with the word shepherd or pastor shepherd and with the word bishop episcopos they're used interchangeably now how they appointed them that is is part of the the great I won't say mystery but how they appointed them is is the word itself that talks about kerotonesantes seems to imply that there is some kind of showing of hands. So whether there was literally an election or, or if the people put forward candidates and Paul appointed them, I just don't know. I don't think we have any way of knowing. And it's not that important. It's just... Again, the only reason I'm bringing it up is because it'd be nice if the things the church does when they call pastors would be similar to what the church did back then. So the elders in Acts 20 are still pastors? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yep. Except now I don't know. Oh, there I am. Verse, okay, so he called the elders of the church back from Ephesus. Remember, he stayed at Ephesus three years. So this is his longest place that he stayed anywhere. And when they came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me, even through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable, and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, what to say about that? First, whether it's individually, one-on-one, in, in large groups, in house to house, or 
in teaching in public, all of those things, to Jews, to Greeks, makes no difference to him. And the message in each place is repentance and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. This is how God saves us, is through repentance that the, that the Holy Spirit works in us. Now, I think repentance is being used there in, sometimes the Bible uses the word repentance and kind of includes everything that belongs to it, like the, not only being sorry for sins, but also the faith that that lays hold of Christ, and that, that being what true repentance is. Here he's using it really narrowly as the first part of repentance, to be sorry for your sins. So that's what he's preaching, repentance. And, and I think a, an example of it in, in the other sense would be, um, would be in Acts chapter 2, again, when Peter says, repent, and they ask, what should we do? Brothers, what should we do uh, on Pentecost? And Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. He wasn't just saying, be sorry, but also believe in Jesus. So that was all included in there. But that's the message. That's what the church does. He's proclaimed it with them for three years, relentlessly, one-on-one, -on -one, house to house, in public. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit. The word is uh, in in Greek is deo, is, is he's having been bound by the Holy Spirit. So it's, it's, the Holy Spirit is the one that is driving the mission in the Gospel of Acts. It's not the, it's not the genius of Peter and Paul and the apostles. It really is the acts of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is the one that is driving ever, all the action. And I love this because it also is you know, for us, it's good to hear, <clears throat> to think of those places where the Holy Spirit is described as a distinct person of the Trinity and acting as a distinct person of the Trinity in his office as the one who sanctifies. So Paul's constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions, excuse me, and afflictions await me. Wow. Yeah. How'd you like to travel knowing that's going to happen to you everywhere you go? Isn't it amazing? He's it's the courage of of Paul and and the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. He says himself. He feels himself to have been bound in the spirit to go to Jerusalem. He's constrained for it. It's not even a voluntary thing. But of course, in a sense it is. There's a great courage there that he's going to go and, and he knows what's ahead of him. But he says, but I do not account my life of any value, nor is precious to myself. If only I may finish my course in the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. You know, that sounds very similar to, uh, familiar to me as far as whenever it's in Romans 9 or 10, when Paul is talking about his brothers, the Jews, and how he would, even if he could give up his own life for the sake of his brothers and sisters in Christ, or that they would, would come to know Jesus that he would rather would lose his life. It's just, he is genuinely, I'm, not, I'm butchering it, that's why I was going to look up real quick just to see if I could, could find it with a quick glance. But, um, you know, he's, his genuine desire for, for the salvation of his people and that this word that he is, is taking out into the world would be heard that people would would grab onto it and be saved through faith in that good news of Christ. It is, I mean, would that God gave me, you know, for would give 
good to all of his people such a heart for the gospel and the preaching of the good news of Christ. What was that? I can't remember. I can't oh, remember. Oh, okay. I thought you were reading that. <laughs> looked like you were reading that. No, I was thinking, well, I give up. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I was going to give it a, a quick chance, but you, you can find it. You'll find it in there, somewhere between Romans 9 and 11, where he finally says, and he says something very similar to that in other places, but um, basically, I you know, if I wish I could just, if I could trade my own life for the sake of, of my brothers and sisters in Christ. He can't make that trade, but it just shows his deep passion and love for the preaching of the gospel. He doesn't consider his life of any value, nor is precious to himself, but only to finish the course in the ministry I've received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. The you know the word gospel in and of itself, euangelion, it just means it means a good news or good tidings. And that is what he is is he received this from Jesus. That's what Acts 9 is all about. Jesus speaks to him from that bright light on the Damascus road. It's not his ministry. He's constrained by the Holy Spirit, he's received the ministry from Jesus himself, but it's to tell the good news of the grace of God. That's the, the good news of, of God's undeserved love in Christ Jesus. My uh, Matthew's confirmation verse is 24. It is. I'm pretty darn sure. That's a great confirmation verse, isn't, isn't it? it? I, I mean, I, I'm, yes. I'm going to ask my sister because she it remembers is. all that stuff. But isn't that? I mean, it's yeah. a when great you... man. I, you think of it in those terms, in that feels very similar to what this is the last time he's going to meet with these pastors in this world, and he's saying something to them like, like our pastors said to us on confirmation, like, here's your charge. Walk in it, and yeah, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And now, behold, I know that none of you, among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom, will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day, that I that I am innocent of the blood of all of you, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. The it's. Paul was smart. You know, whenever Paul, whenever Paul preached the gospel, he he was smart and thoughtful in the way he did it. He wasn't he wasn't just kind of mechanically saying the same things in every place, and he could think through law and gospel strategically as he preached the gospel. But that that language of preaching the whole counsel of God, that is what. A church calls a pastor to do. That's what your church called me to do, is to preach the whole counsel of God. Because it is really easy sometimes to, if you look at, for instance, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Once again, Paul's talking in 2 Timothy 4, Paul's talking to, to this time it's Pastor Timothy and his word there is, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering the time of my departure has come. I fought the good fight, I've, I've finished the race, I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness. Some of that language is going to creep back into 
or the way of expressing itself is is going to creep back in here at chapter twenty. But I just, my my only point there in verse twenty seven is it is a tempting thing for a you know our culture on especially on things like sexuality and in the embrace of of cohabiting and and homosexuality and and all of the no it's everything the whole world is flipped upside down on its head and it, it would be hard to even make a list that we probably fill an hour talking about but and it's tempting in those circumstances to say well I don't want to talk about that one because you might make somebody mad well you might make somebody mad there you might make somebody mad on this one and the truth is you won't preach through a whole evening <laughs> <laughs> if you're worried about you know, offending, if you're worried, you know, Paul's, you know, preached through that whole night. He's preaching the whole counsel of God. That's what the church has to do. Whether people like it or, or, or don't like it is really irrelevant. It's the message of, of what Christ has given. And I think that's for us, too. Not, it's not just a pastoral thing for you as, as the people of God, too. If it's God's word, then then it's important, and I don't get to throw it out. It's it's part of that whole counsel of God that that we should hold on to and confess, and not let it be replaced with with the way of the world. Twenty eight. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Right? This is his charge to the to the elders, the pastors there. Pay careful attention. Just watch out. Beware. Watch out for yourselves. And to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Paul regards their call as coming from God. Even though Paul, whatever Cairo Tonesantes means, whether the people participated in that by putting forward the ones that Paul laid hands on. Paul appointed these men into the, the ministry of the church, but Paul regards them as having received their call from the Holy Spirit. And in, in the same way, whenever we talk about a pastor's call into the ministry, we talk about that it's, that's, we, it's not, we didn't hire this guy to do these things that he's been called by God. And if you notice, Paul's call was immediate. God himself stood in front of Paul and said, you, you're going. Right? These elders, their call was, we would, we would say, it was immediate call. It wasn't Jesus standing and saying, you're going, like he did to Paul. It was through Paul, Paul ordaining them into the ministry. But the Holy Spirit, the Lord of the church, is the one who's done it. He's the one that's called them into the ministry of the church. He's the one that made them overseers. That word is episkopos, and it's our word for bishop. You, you probably hear episcopal in there, our word for bishop. The Holy Spirit has made you overseers to, to do what? To care for the church of God. And that word is, is I, how does yours translate that one? Be shepherds of the church of God. Yeah. I, didn't, I don't know why the ESV translates it, care for the church of God, and it is shepherd, the church of God. So that is their call, is to be a shepherd. And just, just the same way Jesus is, he, he calls it to all the flock, because Believers are the flock of Christ. He's the yeah. good shepherd. So the the pastors, they're supposed to be shepherding God's flock under the the headship of the good shepherd. Um, to care for the church of God, to shepherd the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Um, I've heard it said, and I... I don't think this is true, but it's F.F. Bruce, I think. I was reading him on this, and he said this is the only time 
Paul attributes the sal salvation to the death of Christ without the resurrection part. Yeah. I don't think that's necessarily true. It's is I think back, but I but it is interesting to me, he says he obtained this church of God with his blood. Mm -hmm. Because the blood that Jesus shed on the cross is the blood of God. Mm -hmm. And it's it's the church of God which God obtained with his own blood. If it wasn't if the blood that was shed on the cross isn't the blood of God, if it's just the blood of some good man or some good popular teacher, it's not saving. What makes it saving is that that blood is the blood of God shed for us. And that's the purchase price. Jesus paid for our lives and our salvation. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Um, I wrote a note on my page. I can't read it. Oh, okay. <laughs> I wrote too small. The fierce wolves, Matthew 7, verse 15. Jesus ta will talk a, a little bit about the fierce wolves that, that are atta attacking and will attack in the last days. Yeah, this is, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or fit figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. And Paul says, after my departure, fierce wolves are going to come in among them. And they aren't going to spare the flock. What is he talking about? He's talking about false prophets. The same way Jesus was. He calls them they, the distinguishing characteristic of a false prophet unfortunately, well, a couple, is they look an awful lot like a true prophet. Mm -hmm. They look, they, they come in sheep's clothing. They might quote the Bible and and know it by heart. You might be very... Might even do a few miracles. Could, could do miracles in, in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And how do you recognize them? Well, Jesus says you'll know the tree by its fruit. I think that the fruit that a, a false prophet would bear or a true prophet is the word. It's what's preached. I, I, I think that it would be, a lot of times people will say, well, you know, I joined that church because that pastor is so nice and that pastor is this, that, whatever. And you hope, well, I hope that works out for you. I hope it's a great church. Everything's <coughs> fine. But... You shouldn't, it's really easy for people to, to be kind of hucksters and, and even to, to be able to peddle God's word and speak God's word. You have to be able to take that back into the scriptures and say, is it true? And, and is what he's, you know, just, just quoting Bible verses and throwing them out to impress people if you're not quoting them in the way that they actually mean is you know to me that's a, a deceptive thing to watch for isn't it and, damning to your soul <clears throat> yes yeah to, to damn yourself and your hearers in a sense there first timothy 4 uh, mm -hmm. it says watch your life and doctrine closely persevere in them the doctrine for in so doing you'll save yourself and your hearers and so we have to care about the doctrine. The thing to watch, he says, so Paul's, he's telling them after his departure, there are going to be fierce wolves not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. 
Therefore, be alert. Can you just, wouldn't you, I mean, if you, as you imagine the, this gathering, you can just imagine them all crying. And Paul, you know, the things that Paul has to tell them are probably so breaking his heart. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. It's, he commends them to God and to his word, which is able to build you up. That's how God strengthens his church. That is how we live as Christians. What builds us up is the word of God. And that's the, that's the wonderful thing about being able to gather in this place and speak God's word together and share God's word together or to read it in our home is that those are the tools that God is using to build his, his congregation of saints and to give you the inheritance among those who are sanctified. <clears throat> the word there, those who are being sanctified, is, is the sense of that hagiazo in the Greek. There is those who are being sanctified. I'm, I just point that out because if you are being sanctified, then somebody's sanctifying you. You aren't sanctifying yourself. You are being that. The Holy Spirit is sanctifying you. It is by grace alone, not, not by what we do, but by what God does. So we receive that inheritance among those who are sanctified. Of course, you, you receive an inheritance because you're part of the family. You don't have to be, but, but this is Galatians 4. He'll riff on that when he says, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Well, he says that because sons inherited what belonged to their father. I know this isn't how we talk today because women inherit. But back then, if the women inherited, all of the land would, would be taken out of a family. So that's why the inheritance could only go down through the sons. They didn't want, they didn't want to give, at the beginning, Judah this piece of land and then find out, you know, 100 years later, Judah swallowed all 12 tribes. Because So anyway, we're all sons of God through, through, through faith in Christ Jesus. But that language of inheritance is great because we're sons of, of God through faith in Jesus. And the inheritance comes because somebody died to bequeath to us that, that heavenly home. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. Remember what he did? He was a tent maker. Yeah, good. He was a tent maker. In all, these, all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. This is, you know, that's not uh, quoted from anywhere in the Gospels. And it at least leads to the possibility of thinking that maybe that words of Christ and teachings of Christ circulated independently after after the resurrection after Pentecost and and that that might be what he's appealing to of course the Holy Spirit is the author of the book so it could just be the Holy Spirit tells him to write what he told him to write but that quote you can't find a a for instance a cross reference to it's but it is, a, he quotes, as the word of, of Jesus himself who said it's more blessed to give than to receive. When he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all, and there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken that they would not see his face again, and they accompanied him to the ship.
kind of powerful. It almost it's a little bit of a a little bit of a, a tearjerker itself to imagine his gathering there with the the Ephesian elders and uh, the love that he had for them. That that had become, in a sense, his longest home since he had been a young man that he'd stayed with them so long and preached the gospel in, in so long. I think that it is... A, you, you think of the verdict that Paul read over, over the Ephesian congregation, and then you think about... But because it's not a, it's not a very... It's... It's a, you better get your big boy pants on because things are going to get really hard for you. It's not a very <coughs> soft message that he proclaims to them of what they are going to be, conf uh, by what they're going to be confronted with later on. But in, in Revelation 2, Jesus says to the church in Ephesus, um, the same, same church, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, write the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. So there's Paul's warning about the, the mm -hmm. wolves. Mm -hmm. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, whom I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Just Jesus' words there from to kind of a follow, follow up to what we heard Paul pray over his, his little church there in Ephesus. That church, who knows what is the condition of, I just have no way of, of in, in Ephesus, it is, of course, Turkey is supposedly a secular, secular Islamic state. You know, one of the most, well, the first true Holocaust came up from Christians in in Ephesus and from Christians in in that region in the early part of the 20th century and kind of as the forerunner of, of the Holocaust with the Jews and, and by Hitler but uh, you always hear the numbers like a million and a half uh, Christians were were killed Armenian Christians were killed uh, in those early years of the 20th century just for being Christians, stolen from their families, their children taken away and raised as Muslims and all that kind of stuff. So it's, uh, I don't know, I, to, to imagine that at the same time you hear Paul saying his poor little church is going to face hard times, but we cannot even imagine you know, what they faced, and and who knows. God will preserve us. It's just the whole counsel of God in preaching that word of life. Well, we'll close there and be at chapter 21 next week. God bless you. Our service tomorrow, or, or for Thanksgiving, is tomorrow evening at 6 o'clock. So 6 o'clock tomorrow evening, not, not on Thursday morning. So... Father in heaven, we, we give thanks for all your blessings to us, especially that we can gather as your sons and daughters and hear your word together. We pray that you would always, that you would always keep a faithful ministry of your church, that you would 
always raise up faithful pastors and teachers and missionaries and that you would would help your royal priesthood to declare your praises and proclaim your goodness, especially as we celebrate Thanksgiving, that our gratitude should always be on our lips for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you, and we'll see you Sunday.